Dear Lord, as we start to come round uh, a little bit of your word this morning, I pray, as always, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the seed of your word. I pray, Lord, that you would grow in us whatever it is that you want to grow in us, and that we would be a people who are known as your people, that we would reflect you well, that we would serve you well, that we would demonstrate you well in all situations and all circumstances. And in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Right. Well, it's been a week and a half. And when I say week and a half, I mean it's been a very long week. It's been a very challenging week. Uh, As many of you now will know, uh, I found out this week that I failed to keep my job. Um, I was unsuccessful in uh, keeping my appointment, which is a little bit of a, shall I say, a bitter pill. It is a bitter pill to swallow, Um, particularly when it's the job that I've been doing for the last four and a half years that I created, that I have built, that I have developed, um, and that has been nationally recognised. So it's a little bit of a bitter pill, but there you go. Um, I can't change their decision. I can only choose my response. How I'm going to deal with that setback and the sort of ramifications that it has for me and for Ronnie, um, well, who knows? Um, And let me be honest, uh, which is probably one of the reasons they don't want me in the job, because being honest is one of those things that I tend to be. Let me be honest, being able to and trying to find a way to handle this disappointment has been and is really hard. I'll be very honest with you, it's very, very hard. Um, Being able to steer uh, a way through things when you are being washed with a range of emotions uh, that change as quickly as flipping Clark Kent when he jumps into a telephone kiosk, you know, to try and turn into that man is really, really difficult. Um, uh, there has been an awful lot to deal with this week. Uh, there is an awful lot still to deal with, and I expect that this coming week there are going to be some uh, other challenges that will go with it. And there may even be additional challenges outside the specific work scope, but I suspect that there's going to be another lot of challenges, perhaps just another layer uh, to place on the cake of troubles. But who knows? Who knows? After last week's message, uh, Steve's mum, Val, she came trotting over to me and said that she wanted to speak to me and she wanted to share a verse with me, a verse from Proverbs. Um, goes like this, Proverbs 16, verse 3, Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. The English Standard Version renders it, Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. And so with the situation that I am currently in, I pondered on this verse as over the course of this week, reminding myself again and again and again that this is all in God's hands, not mine. God's hands, not mine. And that word commit there in the Hebrew is the word gol, gol, commit. And it's derived from a root word in Hebrew, galal which means to roll, to roll. So we're to to roll our actions. We're We're to roll our work onto the Lord. We're to roll our burdens onto him. We're to roll it. And when you picture rolling, it's a it's a continuous movement, isn't it? It's a continuous movement. You don't just plonk it down there and, and, and walk away. You, you roll it. You continue with it. You roll it. You push it along. You keep pushing it along. And there's often effort involved in that. There's often energy involved in that and energy which is expended. And you know what? That rolling can take a bit of time, right? That can take a bit of time to roll. You think of rolling a boulder up a hill. 
You know, it can really wear you out. You're pushing it up there and you're pushing it up there and you, you push it so far and then you have to stop and you have to take a little rest and it rolls back a bit and you've got to run after it and you've got to grab it. Then you get back up there and you start pushing it up a bit more and you have to backtrack and you start over and it takes time and it takes energy and it takes effort. But the rest of the verse tells us, doesn't it, in Proverbs, that when we do this, our plans will succeed or our plans will be established. But it isn't us who establishes those plans. It isn't us who makes those plans succeed. It's God. It's God. So we are, our, we are to roll our work onto the Lord so that he, he, the Lord, will establish it. And if he is the one establishing it, why worry? Why worry? In his book on Proverbs, uh, J.H. Greenstone writes this, True faith relieves much anxiety and smoothens many perplexities. True faith relieves much anxiety and smoothens many perplexities. So whether I've had true faith or not has been really under the microscope this week, let me tell you. It really has. And with the level of anxiety that I've been feeling this week, I would say I probably don't have a lot of true faith. So it's been a challenge. It's made me wonder. But that verse that Val gave me was really helpful because it set up. I had an interview on Monday. was told later on in the week that that wasn't going to be the case. So having that in my thinking on the Sunday just set things up for me. It was really helpful to focus my thinking to give me something to come back to as the week sort of chugged on. So I didn't make it to the prayer meeting on Tuesday because I felt very raw. Um, and I know that many of you uh, consider me in your prayers, and I'm very grateful for that. I think in 48 hours, I think I managed to get five hours sleep. Uh, five hours sleep in about 48. And so I was, my headspace was not that great. And so you can imagine then, can't you? As I sat there wallowing in my self-pity, <sighs> I didn't really feel much like putting a message together today. I so didn't. Uh, in fact, what on earth could I possibly talk on? What could I talk on? And then I thought, well, you know what? With a book full of people who demonstrate to us what life is like, what real life is like, people who are facing struggles and challenges. I'm a bit spoiled for choice, actually, aren't I? Because that book that we have in front of us, most of us, is full of people with struggles and who have to make choices in life. So I was a bit spoiled for choice. So let's see where we ended up, shall we, as we track through this little journey. There's, there's a great little story in Scripture about a guy who's sent by God to head off and to tell some folk that they need to sort their act out. They need to sort their act out or else. The problem is, this messenger of God, this prophet, he doesn't much like the folk that God is planning to send him to. And knowing that God is going to show them some mercy, he decides that he's going to do a runner. And he's going to head off in the total opposite direction. Well, they didn't have cars and planes and all of that stuff back in the day. So what he does is he jumps on a boat and he sails off, doesn't he? Well, we get a bit of a problem coming on now because if God tells you to do something and you do the opposite, then you can expect to feel some consequences. And that age-old principle of you reap what you sow will come home to bite you. It will come home to bite you. And that's exactly what happened. Because a huge storm whips up this boat and picks it up and tosses it around. And sailors, sailors being the superstitious bunch that they are, decide then to cast lots to see who has caused this chaos. And, well, all roads point to this guy, the prophet. And so they lob him overboard. They throw him overboard. So I'm sure you know who we're talking about. Who are we talking about? Jonah. The prophet Jonah. Hmm. Take a look at Jonah. Turn to Jonah chapter 1. I'll put it up here anyway if you don't want to. But Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1 verse 15 to 16. We'll pick it up here. 
Then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Things are not going well for Jonah. There's a storm. He's been identified by Lotto as the culprit, and he's lobbed overboard. Thankfully for the sailors, the storm then stops, and they're so gobsmacked by the power of God that they sacrifice to him, and they vow to serve him. You know, it's not something I've really thought about before, but just ponder that just for a moment. Even when someone, Jonah, was called by God and doesn't do the work that God has called them to do, God can even use that situation of disobedience to affect the lives of people around. The disobedience of Jonah led to those sailors coming to God. The disobedience of Jonah led to those sailors sacrificing to God and vowing to serve him. Which I thought was quite interesting. Would that ever have happened had Jonah been obedient? Well, I think it would. I think the same outcome would have happened. But I think it would have been done over a nice drink, on calm seas, and in pleasant conversation with the crew. So I think the outcome would have been the same for the sailors. But the actions of Jonah, his lack of obedience, didn't thwart the plans of God. The actions of Jonah and the disobedience of Jonah just got him wet, got him lobbed into the middle of an ocean, got him well out of sorts. And so Jonah, as he's bobbing up and down there, just when he thinks, oh, this probably can't get any worse, a dirty great big fish then comes along and swallows him up. Now... I'm thinking, as I'm putting this message together, I'm having a bad time. Jonah is in a different league, right? Jonah is in a different league. He's having a really bad time. Jonah's out there bobbing away on the oggin. These guys flared up the barbecue and doing a little bit of a sacrifice and sausage sizzle or whatever they were doing, thanking God for stopping the bad weather. And Jonah's floating around and... And I wonder what Jonah must have been thinking as he was out there watching the stern of that ship get further and further away from him. The sailors giving each other high fives because it's nice and calm and they're about to have a fry up. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever dived off a ship in the middle of the ocean. Outside of land, in the middle of the ocean. I don't know if you've ever done that. It is a real nerve-wracking thing, actually. I found it a real nerve-wracking thing. Why is it a nerve-wracking thing? Because the ocean is vast, and there, there is you, one tiny little bit of flesh floating in the middle of this vast place, something very wide and something very deep. And we all know what lives in the deep, don't we? It's like... Actually, it's probably one of the beauties of being approached by a shark because you always hear the cello first. You always, you always get that. So that's probably one of the beauties. But I remember years ago when I was out in the Persian Gulf and I was having to do a, a dive under the ship's hull. And it is a real odd feeling. You're in the middle of nowhere and you're just diving and... <laughs> It's just big. It's big. You know, the ocean is really big. And as I came back past under the sort of Jacob's Ladder to get back out, I got dragged um, out really quickly because this dirty, great, big, knobby Clark shark had, um, had come floating on past. Um, easy, you put shark watches out and all of that sort of thing. The sense of just how small you are and just how vast the ocean is is absolutely <laughs> staggering staggering um, 
back in February 2006 here in New Zealand, an ex-Navy diver, a guy called Rob Hewitt. You may remember this um, from the news. Rob um, was lost at sea when he was out diving on a, uh, out on a diving trip with his mates up in the uh, Kapiti coast. And he got caught in a rip, and he, then he hit the surface about 600 metres behind their boat and, and was just pushed further and further away. Um, and he spent the next four days and three nights drifting uh, up the coast towards Mount Taranaki. Uh, and he says this, I went missing around three, four o'clock in the afternoon, around nine o'clock at night. OK, I'm in trouble here, so what do I do? What do you do? What do you do when your back's up against a wall like that? I guess it was about facing my greatest fear, and my greatest fear was dying. <coughs> what it was like to die. What does it smell like? What does it look like? And these are the things that I initially had to push through. And he notes in his account that he had to try and stay calm, reminding himself he was a diver, he was a ship's diver, he just needs to stay calm, he just needs to keep himself happy in the water. He was he's happy in the water, it's good. It's not, a, it's not like he'd fallen overboard and he couldn't swim. You know, he was a diver, he was used to being in the water. And then he says, I started to pray. And he says, Karakia, I connect to my tipuna. I talk to my now members who have passed away in that next space and just try to connect. I connect my soul, my warua, my spirit, and myself to something that gives me hope. And he wrapped up his feelings by saying, I had to believe I had some mates and now members and people I didn't even know out looking. But as I believe, I also disbelieve. I think that nobody cares. It's about that warua of mine coming up, going down, hitting rock bottom, thinking that it's rock bottom and then next minute it's not. Because next time I go down into that depression space, it's even darker. And each time I go down, it's harder for me to come out. You know? Eventually he was found, eventually he was rescued. He had folk out looking for him. Jonah? Hmm. No. Jonah was having a really, really bad day. He didn't have folk out looking for him. I mean, as bad days go, it doesn't get much worse. Out in the middle of nowhere, with no one looking for you, where dark things play around. So, can't get worse. But it does, doesn't it? If you look at that next verse, Jonah 1, verse 17, just a little aside there, the Hebrew text moves into chapter 2 here, just to let you know, the English has a different way of working it so if you have hebrew bibles it would be hebrew 2 verse 1 but in the english it's jonah 1 verse 17 jonah 1 verse 17 says this now the lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow why didn't the lord just send another boat along right he could have he could have sent him another boat no he's gonna right, disobey me stand by so the lord sent a great fish to swallow jonah and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. So just when Jonah thought that things couldn't get worse, a dirty, great, big fish comes out of the darkness of the deep and sucks him up. <laughs> what a nightmare. I don't know if you've ever been in the sea when something just brushes past your legs or your feet uh, and you think, oh, what was that? You know, and you're sort of looking and scanning the water. I don't, I don't, have you ever had that before? Or you just don't care? I've, hey, I've dived and I, I, there's horrible stuff down there. And so when stuff comes and brushes against me, I'm like, ooh, ooh just, just, yeah, whatever. Makes you jump a bit, you know, it makes you jump a bit. And I'm not so sure that Jonah would have been as cool as a cucumber when he suddenly realised, as he's, I'm not alone. Oh. I'm not alone. And that this thing from the deep has a little bit of a nibble on him. In fact, when I read this, uh, before he was even swallowed by this thing, he'd started to drown. Don't know if you picked it up before. Jonah had started to drown before he was swallowed up by this fish. You read the account in chapter 2. Jonah's now in the belly of the fish, right? And he starts to reflect and recount how he ended up in such salubrious surroundings. So Jonah chapter 2 verse 1 to 7 says this, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. And he said, this is Jonah, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. 
I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me, you threw me in the ocean depths, not the sailors. You threw me in the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. And then I said, oh, Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves. The waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. And I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. And I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As, I, as my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. So this is an account of a man getting battered by waves, getting dragged down to the depths, and he is drowning. He is drowning. Just, just think about this. As I was reading this, I'm thinking, man... That is a bad day. You have been lobbed overboard. You're in the middle of the ocean. You know that there's lots of nasty wigglies around there. And you are sinking. Your head's covered with seaweed. You're taking on board water. And you know that you are having a really bad day. And as your life is slipping away from you, with the last vestiges of air come out of your lungs, you remember the Lord in prayer and you reach out to him and the dirty great big fish comes and gobbles you up. How bad a day is that? Really? What a bad day. I mean, he was probably thinking, oh, great. I'm just about out of air and now this monster has come and eaten me. You know, if you're drowning, you're hoping that somebody's going to reach in and, and, and throw you a rope or reach down. Maybe the boat would have come back. But, but he's struggling there. He's under the water. He's, 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 he's got the last bit of air and he grasps out to God and he, and he looks through the deep. And coming out of the deep is his jaws. And he's like, oh, really? Really? Little wonder he describes himself as being in Sheol, the land of the dead, is it? Little wonder. So if anyone ever deserved to be recognised for PTSD, it is Jonah. Uh, that whole situation would have totally and completely freaked him out. And it was in this place, this place devoid of hope, the land of the dead, Sheol, that Jonah called out to God. Every one of us at some point in our life will arrive at a place where we need to call out to God. Every one of us. For some, it will be really early. And when that happens, they've then got the opportunity to vote, to devote their years to the service of God in whatever uh, situation he places them. For others, it's really late. Some even down to a deathbed. But at some point, everyone will cry out to God before their spirit leaves them. Everyone. And you know, life gives us the opportunity to choose which one of those groups we're going to fit into. Are we quick to recognise God and his call or are we slow and wake up when it is really too late to have been that effective? That's our choice. You know, I'm someone who reflects on things. I, I think about things, I ponder, I unpack, I examine. And I look back over my the last what, 40 years of my life um, and I think, you know, running like Jonah for much of that time, doing my, doing my damnedest to avoid any interaction with a God that would require a change of my heart, my soul, and my mind. I spent about 40 years doing that. And that run never took me to any positive points in my life, ever. Never. Because when a life is centred on self, what it does is it loses perspective. And when a life loses perspective, it no longer functions in the way that it ought to in correspondence to what's happening around it. There's friction. Nothing runs quite right. There may be successes. There may be successes. There may be moments of pleasure. But in terms of long-term <coughs> satisfaction, there's nothing sustainable. It's all fleeting. And Jonah is now 
absolutely devoid of hope, languishing in the belly of this fish. And he cries out to God. And what's the outcome? Well, Jonah 2 verse 10. And then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Basically, the fish puked him up onto the beach. (laughs) Off you go, Jonah. You're there. You've arrived. Mind the gap. Stand clear of the doors, please. And this huge fish that Jonah had become so intimately acquainted with over the three days and three nights spat him out onto the shore. A dejected, battered, traumatised prophet landing on the seashore, standing there, no doubt, blubbering like a good un. It's that sort of moment. I don't know if you've ever watched Blackadder. Uh, have you ever watched the, the series Blackadder? And in the last one, Blackadder goes forth and he's trying to get out, getting out of the trenches, so he pulls underpants on his head and he shoves pencils up his nose and he sits there going, a wibble, a wibble, a wibble. This is almost like one of those moments where he's just lost his marbles, that Jonah would have been stood there, underpants on his head, going, wibble, 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 I don't know. You know, absolutely freaked out. Don't doubt that. And so what does God do? God tells him to relax, chill out. Take time to recharge your batteries, get your head back in order. Just just rest. It's been a dreadful experience, right? Wrong. Jonah 3, 1 to 2. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up. Get up. Get to that great city of Nineveh and deliver the message that I've given you. His instructions are laid out once again. Get up. Do what I wanted you to do. And deliver the message that I have entrusted you with. You know, just because you disobey the call of God doesn't mean that the call of God is going to change. If God wants something done, God wants something done. Nice and simple, whether you like his method or whether you don't. Immaterial. You will either get on and do the work that he wants doing, no questions, no fuss, Or he will help you come to your senses. Or he'll find someone else to do the job that you've been tasked to do. And I'm not sure about you, but if I had asked someone to do something for me, and not only had they failed to do it, but they'd actively gone out of their way to do the opposite, my faith in them is now pretty limited, right? My faith in them would be pretty limited. And it's highly unlikely that I would actually ask them to do anything for me again let alone within a few days. The will of God, though, prevails and the grace of God shines through. You've got a second chance, Jonah. You've got a second chance. I still want you doing this. Why don't you just crack on, eh? Crack on. Do what I've asked you to do. And we know, don't we, that that's exactly what he does. Exactly what he does. And the people of Nineveh, they listen to what he says and they change their way of living. And they're transformed. That people are transformed. And so this is a wonderful little story of redemption. It's a wonderful little story of grace. Grace both to Jonah and to all of those whom he ministers. Now, we can discuss all sorts of points around the book of Jonah. Um, How should we read it? Is it literal? Is it metaphorical? Was there really such an event? All of that. And I've got absolutely no intentions of diving into the historicity of the account uh, for this particular message, why that would be fascinating. And some of you are going to be sat here thinking, oh, thank goodness for that, because all he's going to do is blah, 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 context, 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 blah, 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 context, context, context. (laughs) Um, What I'm actually interested in as I was pulling this together, I was looking at the imagery, how the imagery of the story plays out. And how we can then perhaps apply that imagery to events that we have faced or we will face. None of us immune to bad things happening in life. None of us. If we think we are, we're missing the point. Uh, And I touched on some of that space when I spoke the other week on balance point. While society in the West makes the pursuit of happiness the big thing, that is not the goal that we should be aiming at. If you're able to have the luxury of pursuing happiness, great, fantastic, crack on. 
good job. What we should be looking at doing is looking at where we can add purpose and meaning to life in the way that we not only conduct our living, but how our life then interconnects with lives around us. And the pursuit of that, the pursuit of those things that we find meaningful, then becomes a moral obligation for us. It becomes a moral obligation to pursue a life of meaning. Which places us in a rather unique position within society. Because if we are morally obliged to do something, we actually need to do something, right? If we're morally obliged to do something, then we actually do need to do something. Jonah was a man of God. He was someone upon whom the Old Testament prophetic mantle rested. He had resting upon him a moral obligation that when God instructed him to speak, he would speak the words of God. He would speak what God had instructed him. The Old Testament prophets prefaced their speech with, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, meaning what you hear coming out from the mouth of Jonah are the oracles of God. So pin your ears back, people. Now, I don't believe that anyone today, anyone today, has the Old Testament mantle of prophet resting upon them. Don't believe it. Why don't I believe it? Because Jesus said they don't. Jesus said they don't. Matthew 11, verse 13, he says, The law and the prophets prophesied until John, John the Baptist. Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were in force until John the Baptist. That's it. Done. Old Testament mantle, prophet. No more, thus says the Lord. So if anyone comes up to you and says, The Lord says you... Park it. Accept it, but park it. Jonah shirked his moral obligation. And by shirking his moral obligation, he ended up in the drink. He ended up in the drink. So tell me, as a follower of Jesus, how much greater a moral obligation rests upon us? We are a people who claim to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, his spirit. We are a people who should carry him and reflect him. And that then is the most meaningful pursuit that anyone who professes Jesus as Lord and Saviour can follow. And then we are morally obliged to do it. And when we don't, when we shirk our responsibility, we too can end up all washed out and at sea floundering in this vast expanse of our existence, wondering what on earth is going on, splashing about in a vain attempt to keep our head above water before we sink under the storm and under the waves, often of our own making. But if, like Jonah, we've found ourselves in this place of turmoil, whether it is through our own foolishness or through the actions of others outside of our control, we still need to be aware of what lurks below in those deep, dark places. Because if we find ourselves losing sight of things, sinking deeper and deeper into a depressive space where it gets darker, and each time we go down it becomes harder to come out like old Rob, I think it's times like this that we need to be very conscious of the way that we think. The way that we think. Because it is in the way that we think, it is the ideas that we begin to take hold of, and when we spend time reflecting on those things, that we will then begin to shape the way that we act. And that will then have a significant impact on the future. And if at that point, something else then does rise up and swallow us, just as we think it can't get much worse... We can then lean on and we can draw on our thinking and we can allow that to keep us projecting forward. You see, the world would have us sink. The world would have us sink deeper and deeper and deeper into despair to allow that thing lurking in the deep to just swallow us up and devour us. But we are a people indwelt by the spirit of Christ. We should have a different focus. We have a moral obligation to have a different focus. 
Paul writes to the church in Rome, Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And it is in this transformation process that thinking changes. And with a change of thinking comes a greater and a deeper understanding of the will of God. May not make the thing that you're going through any easier to swallow, because that pill may still be very, very bitter. But through the process, the will of God will be worked out. And as that happens, like Jonah, when he came out of that belly of that fish and he was spat out there on the beach, we too can be lifted out of the depths of despair We can be lifted out of that land of the dead and we will be landed on a shoreline of promise because that's what Nineveh became, a shoreline of promise with a transformed mind, a renewed sense of purpose and one that now aligns itself with the will of God. Have no doubt about this. When that process occurs in us, the actions that then flow from us will lead to further transformation in the lives of others. It will. The people of Nineveh repented and they turned and God's grace flowed and God's will was done. The will of God prevails and the grace of God shines through. The pattern was true then and the pattern is true today. I just want to encourage each one of you today whether you are facing whatever challenge you are facing, whatever you are pushing uphill, whatever it is that is challenging you, roll it. Roll it onto the Lord. Roll it onto the Lord so that he, the Lord, will establish whatever it is that he desires to establish. Isaiah 43, one to three says this, do not be afraid. For I have ransomed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel your saviour. Bless you, church. May his grace and his peace rest on each one of you as you serve him in our community. Let's just pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the amazing characters that you have in your word. Uh, Some of them you could spend a lifetime just unpacking. I thank you, Lord, that you don't let us go either. No matter what the world throws at us, no matter how rubbish the times feel at at times, you are our rock, you are our anchor, you are our point of reference. And Jesus, I thank you so much that you understand what it's like to be us, what it's like to feel that you put on our humanity and that we can see everything about this great spirit that we call God the Father in and through you. Thank you, Lord. Go with us this week, I pray. And I ask, dear Lord, that your your hand of favour and blessing would rest on everybody that is here this morning and every family that is associated with them. In your name I pray.